it's pretty much a test of the economic governing capability of China. What do you make of the recent phenomenon and as a result reflecting the level of capabilities? So I smiled to myself as you asked me the, the start of that I question. I did notice that. But uh, it, it's not the first time that China has faced economic tests. Um, it's probably the first time that the world has been as focused on those tests as it is. Why is that? And I think it's a reflection of, of how important China has become to the world. Um, as I've described many, many times in my previous life, uh, for much of the past decade, China was creating uh, the equivalent of another country in, in, a, in a very short period of time. During the, 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 the wildest days of the Greek crisis, I used to say, who cares about Greece? China creates another Greece every three months. Um, so when the Chinese financial markets uh, come under some stress, it's not surprising that uh, the, there are people increasingly concerned around the rest of the world because what it really tells you is how important China has become to the world economy. And uh, the, the, the additional thing I would say is it would be very unlikely if China carried on on this remarkable success story which really goes back for 30 years especially when it's trying to rebalance its economy without additional challenges. Um, based on the way Chinese policymakers have dealt with past challenges, uh, I have some belief that they will be able to meet these challenges. Can you be a little bit specific as to what kind of, where does your confidence come from in terms of China's uh, economic governing capability. I, I could speak for hours well, about this, about but let, let me give you <laughs> three parts of the answer. So I, I remember coming here in 2010 when it was very popular then for people to worry about a major housing bubble in China. Mm. And I was really impressed when I spoke with some reasonably junior policymakers uh, that it gave me the impression that Chinese policymakers were going to focus on doing things to stop house prices going up. And I frequently challenge many of my friends in the United States and across Europe, tell me another big country that has ever successfully stopped house prices going up. Mm. And they, they struggle. And so, Does it have to do much with China's political system? I, I, in some ways, I think the nature of Chinese political uh, system makes it a bit easier to deal with some of those challenges. In, in many Western democracies, it's pretty hard mm. to stop a house uh, price spiral before it ends up turning into a catastrophe. But from what I can see, China has dealt with that reasonably well, and you don't see so many people around the world complaining about that anymore. Now we have another, another set of mm -hmm. challenges. The second thing I would say is I, I think an additional complexity is because China's deliberately moving to a new style of growth, the, the, the evidence of weakness in what I like to call the old China, which is heavy industry, uh, industry based on very low labor costs, uh, rampant export growth, a lot of state-directed investment for construction. All those things are weak, but it's being replaced by a, a different sort of China. And a lot of people who exist in, in my old space and some that exist in my current space are, are easily attracted to, this, to the signs of weakness from the old China. Mm -hmm. and not so focused on the new China. And frankly, just as it's been the case throughout my professional career, unless you spend a lot of time here, you can't tell what's really going on. The, the, third, the third thing to say very quickly is, of course, on the financial markets, which is what you're hinting at too. People seem to forget that despite what's happened, compared to a year ago, the Chinese stock market, I think, is still showing the largest rise 
of any uh, of the G20 stock markets in the world. So from my old experience as somebody in the financial markets, it would be pretty remarkable if there hadn't been a correction given how much it had risen. You seem to mention about the role of the government. Yeah. There has been a lot of debate about the role of government, how much it should be in terms of a market economy, even with Chinese characteristics. Yeah, I think there, there are two, two issues to say on that. First of all, I, I think in some areas where urgent attention is needed, especially when it comes to financial markets, I suspect the Chinese authorities are in a position to actually act quicker than you often see in democracies. Um, it's very fashionable around the world to criticize the degree of Chinese intervention in markets recently, but I don't think I need to remind too many people that lots of Western countries have done that as well, mm -hmm. uh, but not with the same speed at which the Chinese authorities. Example? So 2008, when we had what is now called the great financial uh, crisis, um, virtually everywhere in the Western world had to undertake some dramatic government intervention mm. of one form or another. And of course in Europe it's been happening by the month for many years. So actually in contrast to what may, many foreign observers may say, I think that gives China an advantage so long as it's used carefully. Where, the second thing to say is where, where it's more intriguing is of course the Chinese authorities, and it's been evident ever since the last five-year plan, have made a clear statement how they want markets to have a bigger say. Decisive role, they say. A decisive role, and with it, uh, this notion of a bigger role uh, for innovation and creativity. And so, uh, somehow the Chinese authorities and leadership has have to marry those two um, at times probably slightly conflicting things in order to achieve uh, these multiple goals. Mm. And about the speed. Mm -hmm. You earlier talked about this transformation. And yeah. you say the old China, new China, new China mainly, mainly driven by the new forms of economic structure. Yeah. Also entrepreneurship, innovation plays important roles. But the speed of it, of replacing so-called the old, is extremely uh, important. Of course, in order for it to, to mathematically influence GDP, yes, indeed. The, the rise of the new China has to be as fast as the decline of the old China. Mm -hmm. And the, I guess the reality is, is that the old China's decline is, is currently happening faster than the rise of the new China, hence why China doesn't grow by 10% anymore. When you invented the term, BRICS, yeah. it was 14 years ago. Yeah. Economies have evolved so much. Yeah. And therefore, since you mentioned about US and China, yeah. what do you think are the distinctive roles these two economies are playing and could play yeah. in terms of the overall world economic development today? Well, in some ways, it, it, it's very straightforward that the US and China are the two dominant economies in the world. Um, putting it in the BRICS context, China has become bigger than the other three BRIC countries put together. Mm. And I like to say to people that even if India grows at a higher rate than China before the end of this decade, China will create unless it's less than five, will create the equivalent of another India mm. easily before this decade is over. So China and the US together essentially drive the world economy. Mm. And so it is really important that those two countries uh, maintain a very good relationship and that they both make progress on further adjustments of the nature that I said earlier. It's very interesting when our conversation reaches this stage. It seems that Many others that we have been talking to have been going very bullish on the United States, its <laughs> economy, even though its economy economic growth rate is much slower than China's, but of course it has a much bigger basis yeah. than China's. Yeah. Uh, and you have been consistently uh, going bullish on China rather than bearish compared to the others. Mm -hmm. uh, why is that? Do you feel, <laughs> I would ask, do you feel lonely sometimes to argue against everyone, <laughs> especially from your part of the world? So, so let me emphasize in answering you that, of course, I'm not in the financial markets anymore. I'm a, a minister. Um, but when I was in the financial markets, I, I quite like not being with the crowd because the crowd is usually wrong in finance. Uh, 
It, it, sometimes it can be an uncomfortable place being away from the crowd, but... Is that how you find your academic place or your judgment? No, Just to be different from the crowd? No, 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 not at all. I, I like to look at the objective evidence and, and link it to the long-term trend of where countries' potential and their policy priorities are and, and not get too caught up in the noise mm. about what's happening tomorrow. Let, let me quickly add, actually for the past few years, since the, reco the recovery of the mess of 2008, I describe myself as having been bullish about the US and China. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, a lot of people think you can't be bullish on both. You've, it's got to be one or the other. But if, if you stand back or, or look from 40,000 feet, perhaps the reason why we had the mess of 0708 is because the US had run out of any domestic savings on the other side of the world or here, China saved too much. And, and to get out of that mess, we needed the US to become a bit more like the old China mm -hmm. and the new China to become a bit more like the old US. And if you look at the evidence that is reported, and I'm not just talking about the latest month, that is happening. Uh, the US current account balance of payments deficit in 2007 was nearly 7% of GDP. Now, in my, for my history, people taught me that the US could never get its current account deficit down unless it was in permanent recession. Current account deficit today is less than 3%, mm -hmm. and they're enjoying 3% growth. That is a good reason, and a much better one, in my view, to justify some optimism about the US compared to all the usual focus on monthly employment data right. and so on. In China, China went into uh, the Great Recession with a current account surplus of 10% of GDP, very weak performance of consumption, and an economy based on investment spending and very low uh, value-added exports. Today, and it has been the case for now nearly two years, Chinese current account surplus is less than 3% of GDP, so less than a third of what it was. Uh, and so it's made a huge adjustment on that together with the United States. The, the, the remaining bit is whether it can get its consumption rates, uh, especially amongst private individuals, not, not to the kind of crazy levels in the US, but uh, above 40% of GDP. But you know, this could be very difficult for you to do. First of all, your public constituencies, they mainly look at the press stories, which is not necessarily all in the same tune mm -hmm. with you, mm -hmm. and also your parliament, for example. So is it like you and the chancellor and some of the others in the current administration would, would, are sailing against the so-called public opinion tide? So let, let me give you a couple more answers to, to relate to this specifically. So first of all, to emphasize the weakness in commodity prices, which is what really matters to most individual British people, is like having the equivalent of a tax cut. So, in fact, if they were really quizzed about if there were some linkage between what's going on in China and commodity prices being weak, which means cheaper prices for gas and petrol and for some foods, mm. most British people would say, I like that. And I don't think they'd, they'd, they'd worry on that part. So, if we are in a, in, a, in a new environment for commodity prices, and that's something which you see evidence of in, in, in what we call the, the real take-home pay and will help consumer spending uh, continue to strengthen in the UK, something that appears to be going on. The second thing is, and going to the, the crux of your question, what we need to do is, is, is get a bit of the success that some of the cutting-edge countries of the old China had done. Germany, perhaps, is the most obvious one, mm. where you see in some big German cities remarkable economic success of some of the industries and businesses that can be directly related to the rise of China. Right. And uh, you don't have that kind of debate uh, in Germany. And that's where we ha if, we're, if we're serious about rebalancing the British economy mm. and trying to improve our export position, we've got to focus on the places where the opportunities are the best. Right. And that's how the proof will come and the, the, the belief in it for British people. It, it may be the case that one of the reasons why the UK has not done so well in the past 20 years with its international trade is that it, it might be regarded as a bit of a fair weather friend. Mm. 
And uh, I think it's very important that if you want to develop lasting relationships to provide the right environment for your businesses, that you are not just a fair weather friend and you are with your partners when, when the inevitable uh, moments of challenge take place. Uh, and I think that's particularly important with China, mm. partly because of the long-term issues that you touched on earlier. The second thing I would say is, unless you wanted to really come to the conclusion that this is the end of the Chinese story, it is in what I like to call our enlightened self-interest mm. to help, if we can, China get through these challenges. And at this moment, we've been hearing from Chancellor George Osborne, who talked about the UK wants to be the partner of China second to none in the Western world. Yeah. Wow, that is quite a, a statement, it, especially when you think about the history of China-British relations. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all the of a sudden, <laughs> has, second to none. Has uh, impressive ambition. And I, I would say, in all honesty, when uh, he invited me to accept this position, it was when we talked about China that I thought, yes, this is something uh, I'm pretty interested in doing. Mm. So I, I, I am impressed by uh, the ambition that our Prime Minister and the Chancellor share. Uh, I think it partly reflects uh, Britain's great uh, status historically as a trading nation, and, and with it, uh, some justified frustration mm. that the UK has not shared uh, its long-term historical success with some of these uh, exciting parts of the world like China in mm. the past 20 years as it should have done. And my final question for you is a very realistic question. Yeah. You talk about this vision, but the reality is a very different story. We've been reading some references about the China and the UK direct investment, foreign direct investment. Yeah. 0 0.1, 0 0.6, that's the inward and outward investment. So where are we now to your vision in the future? There seems to be a very long distance. Well, I, I think on the export story, um, the pace of export growth from the UK to China has been really strong. And, and that's why we want it to continue or possibly accelerate. Mm. And if we could have the same kind of export strength with other parts of the world, we, we wouldn't be so concerned about our own balance of payments position. On the foreign direct position, uh, direct investment, um, even if the absolute level is low, that's kind of reflection of history. And, and, and what is uh, quite exciting that if you look at the last two or three years, mm -hmm. the pace of increase of foreign direct investment between China and the UK is accelerating significantly. I think I'm right in saying that already the UK is now the, the most preferred destination for foreign direct investment in Europe. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if it carries on at the pace we have seen, and of course one of the purposes of our trip is to encourage that to accelerate further in many different parts of uh, the UK economy and also simultaneously to try and open up more foreign investment opportunities here in China, then at some stage in the future when we're having this discussion, you won't be able to quote back that, <laughs> that very low statistic to me. I hope that will be the case. Thank you so much, Commercial Secretary Jim O'Neill. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you very Thank much. You.